This episode of The Candid Frame is brought to you by the Charcoal Book Club. Their carefully curated selections reflect the best in contemporary photography and all for a reasonable price. And they are delivered directly to your doorstep each month. They offer free shipping to the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. It's subsidized elsewhere. It's a great way to begin or expand your photo library. Join the club at charcoalbookclub.com today and remember to use the code THECANDIDFRAME at checkout and receive a 10% discount on your first membership payment. This episode of The Candid Frame is also brought to you by Frames Magazine. It's a quarterly publication that showcases the work of many of the best in contemporary photography, including Steve McCurry, Martin Parr, and Amy Vitale. Each issue is beautifully printed and thoughtfully curated by its editors. It's a wonderful way to discover and be inspired by great photography. Subscribe today and use the promo code THECANDIDFRAME to enjoy a 10% discount on your monthly and yearly subscription when you visit readframes.com forward slash join. Hello, this is Ibarian X, and welcome to the 600th episode of The Candid Frame. It's been a long and crazy journey, and I'm so glad that I'm still here producing content for you and having these wonderful conversations with amazingly talented and generous people. When I started the show, I really had no clear idea of where it was going to go. I just know, I just knew that at the time, I wanted to be listening to a show just like this, but it it didn't exist at the time. Podcasting was still relatively new. Uh, there were a couple of other podcasts there were that were out there making shows, including you know Martin Bailey at the Martin Bailey Photography Pod- Podcast and uh, Chris Marquardt at uh, Tips from the Top Floor. Two two podcasters who are still here along with me, and I knew that I wanted a show where people would talk about photography and the process. And not so much focus on gear. And even though I wasn't seeing that reflected in in the potosphere at the time, I knew that there were other people like me who wanted to hear those conversations, who wanted to gain the insight that comes from just talking about everything but gear. Because, you know, there's no shortage of that out there, whether it's podcasting or YouTube or Facebook or... No, I wanted I wanted something different, and I'm so glad that that the show has really stuck to its guns with respect to that. Um, the show could have changed in any variety of ways in in an attempt to grow a, to grow audience and and build numbers in order to you know pursue that elusive you know uh, advertising revenue that exists out there. And I never was tempted to to change the show. In that way, because I knew what I wanted the show to be, and I knew what it needed to be. And I so appreciate the many, many people who not only came and appeared uh, as guests on the show when podcasting was just, you know, uh, an idea that most people didn't understand, but the many people who started listening to the show and spreading the word and became loyal listeners and supporters of the show, whether they supported the show financially or not. Um, one of the gratifying things about producing this show is, is I've had conversations with, with so many people over the past 16 years who told me how much of a difference this show made in their lives and, and their careers. That listening to the to this show and to the episodes and and to the conversations really emboldened them to pursue their own passion their own desire to make a life as as a photographer that hearing these diverse stories and the different paths that all these different photographers you know wound their way through and up um, to to achieve some some semblance of success in whatever way they they define success, that it was possible for them too to live out this this dream. And I'm so glad that this show has been that and will continue to be that for so for so many people. For for myself, one of the things that that I'm so grateful for is that I 
think I love doing the show more than when I started. And to be able to say that about something that you've been doing for 16 years, uh, I know is a rarity. It's a real blessing to be able to say that I have not become bored with producing the show. I've not grown bored or fatigued by putting in all the work to produce an episode. I, I, I love it. I enjoy it. You know, I enjoy it as much as I do my own, my own photography. Uh, every time I sit down with someone, whether it's over, you know, over the computer or in person, I get to enjoy an, a conversation with another human being and we just get to sit down and chat and all the noise and all the, all the negativity that, that exists out there is sort of put aside and we get to connect. And if anything, if I've wanted anything to change with the show is that I've wanted to, to, to make that connection even more important with, with the show. Uh, as much as I love talking about the process and photography, I really want to come away from each conver- conversation feeling like there was a, a genuine exchange between me and the guests. Because I think that that's lacking in the world. And I want to make sure that I'm putting out content that that speaks to that. That is doing more than just providing another another distraction in which to, you know, pass the time. I hope that this show continues to be valuable to you. I hope that this show inspires you. I hope that this show helps you to realize what is possible in your life. Whether or not you choose to do that with a camera or not. I'm just so grateful for for being here. And I can honestly say that this, this show has helped help change who I am. And there have been a lot of, lot of things that I've gone through in the last you know, 15 or 16 years, all of which have helped to shape me. But these conversations have taught me one of the most important lessons of my life, and that is learning how to listen and how to respect someone else's journey, their experience, even if I don't completely agree with what they're thinking or what they're sharing or, or what, they, what they believe in. That's okay. That the ability to be able to genuinely, genuinely listen to another human being and be respectful of that uh, has been an important life lesson that I carry in all aspects of my life. And when I was thinking about having someone on the show, um, I was talking to Matthew Jordan Smith and I couldn't think of a more appropriate person to join me on the show. He's been a guest on the show before, but we share a really special connection for a variety of different reasons, uh, reasons some of which you'll, you'll hear in, in this episode. But Matthew is a genuine guy and he's a, a gift not only to the photographic community, but his presence uh, is a gift in my life, even though we don't get to talk or, or break bread uh, as often as I would like. But I hope that this conversation and, you know, his story at this point in his life and his work, especially his, his work with Aretha Franklin, uh, provides you not only some insight into the photographic process, but that you just enjoy our time together. So, this is Ivadian X. And welcome back to The Candid Frame. Matthew, it is so good to see you. It's good being here, man, and good seeing you. Yeah, yeah, both of us getting a little grayer there. Yes, yes, indeed, for sure. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good thing. It just proves that we're still here. Uh, Absolutely. We're still here plugging away, doing what we love. That's, That's all we can do. Yeah, and blessed to yeah. be able to do it. Uh, I don't keep up with you as much as I should, but when I do, it's just like, man, you're always doing so much. <laughs> I, I think I'm busy, <laughs> but God, 
I, I don't know where you pull that energy from and and to keep such a sort of positive attitude. And that's one of the things I kind of wanted to talk to you about. I, I want to talk to you about your work, and I want to talk to you about that Aretha book. But, you know, I, I think that we've talked before, and we've talked a lot about, you know, a lot of different things. But one of the things that I, I'm, I'm, I want to touch on with people who I'm, I'm close to is is finding out what are they doing doing to sort of not only sustain their careers, but sustain themselves. Because as we're all getting older and things are changing and we're losing people, Yes. It it changes yes. it changes a whole lot in terms of what we consider priorities. I mean, when we're young, all it's all about our career. You know, but when yeah. you get older, those perspectives, you know, those things change. But nevertheless, you still gotta do all the hustling that's required to sort of you know, sustain. But the you career, can't hustle you, you tr- without having help. I found that out, you know, um Yeah. It's funny thinking back about things now, like uh, thinking about COVID and all that. During the pandemic, I'm here in Japan. You know, they were supposed to have the Olympics in 2020. It was canceled or postponed. Remember that? Postponed mm-hmm. for a year. All of us thinking that, oh, yeah, in a year it'll be over. Uh-uh. 2021 comes. It's still raging, maybe more than it was in 2020. And I get assigned to do a job that was unlike any I've ever done before. I get assigned to actually it was a historic job because it was the first time it's ever been given. I was hired by the IOC to live in the Olympic Village and document the athletes. They don't normally allow people in the village. It's like a, a no man's zone for photographers, press. They do have a press area where people go to that press area and do interviews in the village, but it's like on the outskirts of the village, but nobody's allowed in the village, really. Uh, if they are, they're allowed in for like an hour or two, and then they have to leave. But they want somebody to be there and document life in the village, and I got the assignment. So I lived in the village for the entire Olympics. And what was so cool about that assignment, it woke me up in a lot of ways. It taught me about health in a different way because it's not just the athletes in the village. It's the coaches. It's it's everybody around the athletes. And I became very close friends with a lot of those people. The athletes, of course, I'm living in the same you know area of everybody. And this one coach was talking to me about health. And he says, you have a good physique. You know, you know, I was very fat at the time. I was like 80 pounds bigger than I am now. He's like, you know, you could have a great body if you if you just, you know, go to work. He says, no, no secret. You just put in the work every day. He's like, but you're working hard. He's like, you know, and your body will break down eventually at this level, you know, if you don't take care of it. Mm -hmm. And right after that, I dealt things in my family, lost my younger sister lost my father. All those things combined woke me up. And after the Olympics, I went home right away to see my my father. I came back and told myself from that moment on, I'm going to put my health first and get in shape. I joined the gym. I go every morning, regardless. I work out. Even if I'm on the road, I work out in the hotel room. That's the first thing I do every day. Because if you don't have your health, you have nothing. So health first. And it's given me more energy, surprisingly, to do more things. So I'm now slimmer than I've ever been in my adult life, which is freaking a lot of my friends out who've known me like, you know, 25, 30 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I feel great now in that process. I, I think about health in so many different ways. Um, I lost my baby sister to cancer. Um, lost Aretha to cancer. Uh, there are so many uh, parallels between, I don't talk about this often at all, between my baby sister and Aretha. I'll talk about it because people who don't know my sister, they wouldn't understand, but for those who, who did know my younger sister, Donna, she looked like Aretha. And I remember the mm-hmm. first time I photographed Aretha, I shot her for 13 years. The very first assignment, I remember going to shoot her and I'm looking through, it's a film camera back then, it's an RZ. I'm looking down into the viewfinder. I'm like, oh my God, I look like I'm photographing my sister. I felt that then, never told anybody that. Actually, I'm not sure if I told anybody that until this year, all these years later. 
But throughout all those years of photographing Aretha, all I saw was my sister as I'm looking through the, the viewfinder. They had a lot of things in common. They both loved soul food or loved food, period. I mean, we all love food, but <laughs> they both loved food and, you know, enjoyed life. And Aretha loved to sing. My sister loved to sing. Uh, you know, nobody can sing like Aretha, of course, but up until the end for both of them, that's what that was a passion. That was what they wanted to do. I, I loved seeing that also because as photographers, as artists, you know, I'm never going to retire. That's not, you know, what artists do. You do it till you stop. That's what I plan to do because for me, it's not a job. It's my love. It's my passion. Aretha was planning a shoot, talking to me about shooting until she was gone. My last conversations with Aretha Franklin the year she passed away was, I just need to get a little more weight on, get my strength back, and then we're going to shoot. We're going to do our shoot. We're going to do our shoot. We worked on, we were trying to work on that shoot for the last year and a half before she passed away. It never happened. But we planned it, had flights three different times, all had to be canceled the last minute. One like the day before. The last shoot canceled the day before as she was rushed to the hospital. Oh, wow. But thinking back about all that, you know, to want to do your craft in that way is special. I'm doing this book now in Aretha Franklin. I'm actually two days away from ending this uh, Kickstarter campaign. I'm raising funds to do two versions of a book. One is a standard edition book, photography, fine art book. The other one is a special edition book. The first book will be a thousand copies. The special edition book will be only 100 copies. And that one will be numbered and signed. Each one coming up in a, a numbered slip case as well. So those 100 books, each person will have their special book. Number number one, number 40, number 69, all those those 100 books will be for those special people. And they'll have a lot of extra content in them. Because she was special and deserved that. And that's that's what I'm trying to do. Make an amazing book, but not just photography, because my time photographing her was filled with amazing stories. Even after she passed, I have incredible stories about Aretha Franklin, and I want to share those and the images that go along with them in this book. I, I loved her from the bottom of my heart. And of course, there are a lot of things on there out there about Aretha Franklin, um, Queen of Soul. There were two movies done. There are books on her. But all three of those major things, the both the movies, uh, the book, they all end before I ever met her. So my book covers uh, a period of her life that nobody's touched on yet. The last decade of her life. And I want to share all that, the joy, the fun, you know, the stories in this book. You, you photographed so many people and you've made, you know, long lasting friendships with, with them over the years. What, were, yes. what, what do you think was the special dynamic that you two had that was unlike any of the other relationships you may have? I, I have some great relationships with a lot, a lot of people. Like even, even now I'm calling a lot of these people. And I'm glad I'm blessed that I can call a lot of people like this and, and ask for their support. It's funny with a lot of the clients that I have special relationships with. It's like you are talking to an old high school friend or, or an old family member. And with Aretha, you know, she was older than me. We had a special bond. And I'm not sure how it began, but we had a bond like like I don't have with other clients. Number one, she never wanted to talk to my agent or, or um, I never talked to a manager, an agent of her. She called me directly. I'd only call her directly. So for every shoot, it was just her and I talking, you know, and putting things together. I don't have that wow. with anybody else. I don't have that with anybody else. And to and have it with her. That's and to have it with her was, and sometimes she called me just to talk. 
I mean, which is kind of crazy. You know, sometimes she'd be watching a TV show. Have, have you seen this show? And we just talk on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Or she'd tell me like, you know, these crazy stories, you know, about, you know, uh, things she's working on. I remember once she called me in the middle of the night, my time, I'm like, who's calling me? I look at the phone and uh, for some reason I had the phone on. She calls and I answer the phone and I'm half asleep. And it's Aretha. She's like, I got a problem, Jordan. She called me Jordan. She's like. I'm lost between these two names of what to call this album. What do you think is better? And she these <laughs> two names that she was thinking of. I'm like, am I having a dream? Am I having a dream? <laughs> I, I think about that now. I'm like, wow, man. It just, she asked me these two names to find out which one I thought was best. I forget which one I said, but... And it was like a short, like 10 minute conversation. And I, I remember hanging up and like, did she just call and ask me like my opinion <laughs> about the name uh, of her album. album? Right, right. So that was cool. That was cool. It doesn't surprise me that she felt that way towards you, even though we haven't spent a lot of sort of personal time together. One of the things I have always loved about you is how genuine you are. It's all the way I know to be. It's it's it doesn't come off to me as it it's a sort of a, a a front or a persona that you put that you put out there. And I've always been curious about about that about you because <laughs> we've never talked about your childhood, but I don't know when you sprouted up suddenly. But I can't I can't help but imagine that when when you know when those genes kicked in. And you started getting to be taller and bigger than everybody else. That as an awkward adolescent or even a teenager, when you're sort of developing, if trying to discover yourself and how to interact with other people, that it couldn't have been easy. And I've it wondered, was not. Is this sort of persona that sort of that came as a result as as for lack of a better word, like a survival skill? Or how much of it was just innately just you? I think maybe a little bit of both. You know, I was born in New York, born in Brooklyn. Um, we lived there until I was seven. And then my family, we moved down to South Carolina. And at that time, it was difficult being a kid from the North going to the South. You know, mm. in, in New York, I was around, grew up, and all I knew was people from all over the world, different accents, different, you know, uh, personalities, just different, you know, races. That was New York, the melting pot. And that was normal. And then I moved down south and it's really just black and white. And I I had a different accent from everybody else. And they picked at me about um, the way I spoke about my, at the time, my thick Brooklyn accent. And I tried so hard to get rid of that accent and speak the way they were speaking with that Southern twang and, mm -hmm. but still didn't really fit in. I felt like an outsider. And my father, who was a preacher, like Aretha's father was a preacher. He loved photography, was his, his hobby. And he taught me photography. And that was my survival mode. And in some ways it still is. You know, if I go to, a party with there are a, a lot of celebrities there. I'll have my camera and it's kind of like a clutch even still then, you know, to fit in, which is, which is funny thinking about that now. Yeah. So I guess all of that. And it's, you know, being a preacher's kid also PK, just learning how to, you know, survive and, and be a certain way as part of, I guess the upbringing as well. So, yeah, the way I am is the only way I know to be. I don't know how to, be fake and I'm doing what I love and yeah well growing up a preacher's kid on top of all that other stuff <laughs> especially if you're in a community where everybody knows everybody's business yes um, yes and down daddy's south daddy's gonna hear about it exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah so it's funny because you either go one way or the other you can either like rebel and go like yeah. you know as bad as you can be or you know because you see that a lot with preacher's kids, you know, but uh, it's funny because even with Aretha, I remember telling her that my father was a minister also, a pastor, preacher's kid, 
and she likes like just gave me a little smile because you know we had that in common of course not i didn't have the same story that she had of course you know with with uh, mm. her famous father we both knew our, our backgrounds in that way and and even even now i was playing one of her albums yesterday uh, on spotify and just just takes me back takes me back i lost my father uh seven months ago to alzheimer's and uh the last days i flew to the states to, to be with my father the last two weeks and i played music and the only music i played was aretha's music because we have memories of that when aretha passed away i flew to the states um and i flew to south carolina first to save my family first and that i flew from there to detroit for the funeral and i remember getting the 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 uh the movie when it came out from uh from the publicist and I was also in South Carolina at the time and my father and I watched it together. So I had the memory of going to the funeral, going back and spending the time with my father, showing him the, the uh, itinerary for the service, talking about it, showing them the pictures of the service and then coming back again and having the movie and watching it for the first time with my father and nobody else watched it with me in the family, but it was just my father and I watching the movie together um, and having that experience together. And then when my father passed, like the day before he passed, I was playing her Amazing Grace CD. And it's just he and I, and we're both, I know, reminiscing about that time. He's looking at me. I'm looking at him. He's trying to like, he, he could not speak at the time, but he's trying to say the words to the song he's looking at me it was my Aretha cool moment with my father mm-hmm. you know years after she passed you know she passed in 2018 my father passed last year I'll treasure that moment forever forever yeah last week I visited my mother after she was in the hospital she had an infection she came home and um, my mom doesn't talk very much she she has the germ of an idea she wants to say. She'll start opening her mouth, and then she almost immediately forget it, and then just says, you know, nothing. Yeah. But uh, my wife and her started singing Besame Mucho, right? <sighs> and my mom just started singing the whole song because she remembered all those wow. lyrics and in her weak, trembling voice, and it was just... You know, it's just lovely. And usually when I'm with her and when I'm driving her somewhere, I'll I'll put on a playlist of old salsa merengue music. Because oh. I know she remembers all that all that stuff. Because the music stays. when I'm driving her Yeah, because if I'm driving her like every ten or fifteen minutes, she's asking me where are we going and I'll tell her where we're going and then she'll forget and then she'll ask me again and then she'll ask me, Is this a new car? And I go, yes, it's a new car. I've had it for 10 years, but yes, it's a new car. But it's, it's, when you're going, when you're going through that, one of the things that for me is that you, you appreciate the moments you're having with them. And even though they won't remember, even like an hour later, they won't even remember that it happened. I, I kind of, I kind of treasure it, treasure it even more. Because I feel like I'm, I'm protecting something for the both of us that we both have, you know, and it sucks. I mean, it hurts and it makes me angry some days to be losing my mother this way, but I lost my dad suddenly, you know, he had a heart attack and just passed away. So it's like, either way, you know, it doesn't take, um, you know, the pain away, but no, no. One of the things I'm very grateful for with the relationship with both my parents is that I have, is that nothing was left unsaid between the both of us. Yeah, know? that part's beautiful, be able to and express yourself openly because you treasure you treasure all those moments later forever. Mm. Forever. And having all those pictures. I I was very happy that I photographed everybody in my family every time I went home to visit them. And shot everything, things that probably seem silly, like, you know, the clothes they wear, the, the coffee mug my father uses, my, my their mother yeah. uses. I photograph all those things. I've always thought about, like, a story, a story, a story. Um, 
So I photograph, of course, them, but then all the other elements around them that that are part of them. Um, and I've done that as like it's like a practice for me as a photographer on on storytelling. Mm-hmm. But now I'm so glad I've done all that because all those things of my father are beyond precious. And my family sees those pictures and like, oh, that was dad's cup that he used. He used to make this. Yeah. He made oatmeal a certain way. So I have pictures of him making the oatmeal, just his hands and, the, and like, oh. S- same with Aretha. I had these, you know, I'm saving all that for the book, but I have all these things that are her that nobody knows, that, but they see it like, oh. you know. Oh, yeah. I, I had an experience like that, not so much with my mother, but my my grandmother, I was over at my cousin's and she was making the cafe con leche, coffee with milk. And they would make the uh, coffee in the little espresso with a little kettle that would, where the lid would pop up and down <laughs> yes. you know, when it's ready. <laughs> and then the milk would get heated up in the, in, in a saucer, right? And then the coffee would be poured into the cup and then the milk into the cup, but then it would go back and forth in order to get the froth. And I remember looking at that, not having seen that in years, and having that same experience of, oh my God, that's how Mama Andrea made us coffee, and how Mama, my mom, you know, when she made us coffee con leche, and we would have little pieces of bread that we would dunk dip inside, into, yes, into the coffee oh. bar, and dip inside, and until it got it was just about to fall apart. Because that's when I really liked it. Didn't want to really firm, just, <laughs> just, just soggy enough, just before it started breaking apart and it melting in my mouth. And it's just those, those, those things. And having yeah. a, having a, having photographs like that that can trigger that in you, even no, no one else may recognize it. I think is, you know, is one of the beautiful parts of 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 documenting those things that a lot of people kind of just overlook and don't think and think of as. Absolutely, Not important man. And they are. Absolutely. And you treasure them later on in ways that you never dreamed that you would. You know, yeah. photographs and music and that combination together. Whew, powerful. Powerful. Definitely. It's funny thinking back about all that now. In terms of the way you're working, has has it sort of shifted what you your priorities in terms of oh, what yeah. you're choosing to work on, how long, you, you know, you may be saying no to things more often than you might have in the past. What What's changed? Absolutely. Now I think about legacy more than anything. I think about that more than the job. Like, yeah, back in my 20s, 30s, like it was like about the assignment and now I'm like, okay, well, I've done jobs like that before. What's going to make a bigger impression? What's going to have, you know, a longer lasting uh, impact? The books definitely do. Exhibits definitely do now. I want to do more exhibits around the world. I want to show a lot. I've got this archive that most people have not seen. So I have, I have an exhibit going on right now and not at a, at a gallery. So... When I opened my Kickstarter at the beginning of March, I had a, a, a small exhibit at a small gallery in Kobe, Japan. Um, I knew the, the curator of that, of that gallery. He offered to give me an opening. So I had the opening there. And now I'm in the last week of my Kickstarter, the end of March. And I have an exhibit that opened up on Aretha Franklin's birthday, which was March 25th. And it opened at the Blue Note, the Blue Note Place here in Tokyo. Which for these images of Aretha are absolutely perfect. The venue's incredible. People go there to hear music. There's this history there of, you know, all of Aretha and, and all these, these singers, but it fits and people are loving it. And the Blue Note is loving it as well. So now they discovered my work. They didn't know I was living here in Japan. You know, I was Aretha's photographer all these years. Um, uh, my wife gave me the idea, contact the Blue Note, tell them that you live here in Japan and that you'd like to do, have an exhibit on her birthday. So I did. They loved the idea and said, we don't want to do it just for that one day. We want to do it for an entire week. So it's up all this week. Um, it will end on Friday. And then there is 
there's a very famous soul food restaurant in Japan. They contacted me and said, oh, when that exhibit opens, would you mind bringing the exhibit here to our restaurant? I'm like, absolutely be great because it fits right in with Aretha Franklin. Yeah. So when it ends, it will go there. And I love the idea of showing work because, you know, I've now, the opening was was an eye-opener for me. Both openings, the one in Kobe and the one here in Tokyo were both eye-opening for me because people who may not have ever discovered your work are discovering your work. And to see your work framed on a wall is very different than seeing it on a device. I mean, it's night and day. Oh, yeah. People Night and day. We're all used to looking at devices, all of us. And you don't have that same connection to an image versus seeing it on a wall and seeing different types of paper. So because I'm here in Japan, I print some of the images um, on washi. Some are printed traditionally as well. Um, Some are printed on Epson paper. And then other ones are printed on, on Japanese washi. And people are reacting here to those pictures on washi because you know it's traditionally it's a it's a, a paper that people know been around for thousands of years um the the scrolls are all made on washi japanese paper but to see a print on washi is super special and it brings out a different type of quality that it was even surprising to me yeah. so it makes it even more special and more more endearing um, we lost Douglas Kirk- Kirkland last year. Yes, yes, and um, yes. He was really, really sad, and I'm so glad that I had a chance yeah. to get to know him. But I remember when I visited him at his studio, he took me to uh, the space where he had all his prints. He was just pulling wow. out prints, and it was just beautiful. He had this one great shot of. Uh, Anne Margaret leaning on a balcony over several stories over a uh, wow. at a from a, at a hotel in a real perilous position, <laughs> but it was it, it was just beautiful prints and you know I just stressed the importance of when you're speaking of legacy about the body of work and and the importance of them being on paper, be it yes. be it in print or, or in a book. Yes. So you have so much so much work. That yeah, has got it published on magazines, but what are you doing in terms of, you know, printing? I mean, I know you sometimes pr- you will print for exhibition, but you have so much stuff. How do you decide, you know, what stuff you're gonna gonna print and to sort of? Oh, that's that's a great question. What are you going to print? Manifestation of the work. You know, in and going through this body of work of Aretha, I, I discovered something right away that. I don't have the eye for finding the gold in the archive. That's when you need a curator, an editor to go through and help you see what we don't see. As photographers, we're so caught up in the photographic aspect of the image. And sometimes Mm -hmm. that gets actually very often that gets in the way. We don't see beyond that. And I'm guilty of that. When I sent pictures into my editor for the first time to the publisher for this new book, they said, oh, can you send us more? We want to see everything. And I was like, oh, they want to see everything. And they were kind of being insistent about it. So I sent a big selection over without even really going through. Just sent them a big selection over and they found things. I'm like, is that my picture? Is that my picture? I didn't even see these images. <laughs> they they sent me a mock-up of a cover. And I'm like, oh my God, that's did I shoot that? I had never seen the picture. I didn't I'd never never acknowledged the picture before. I had to go back through my archive to find the image. I'm like, oh wow, I didn't see this before. And it was so funny when I had the opening exhibit to the Kickstarter, a man walked up to me and said, These are beautiful pictures, but that one that one speaks to me. That's my favorite. And he was talking about that same picture that they had pulled out. Then I go to have the exhibit here in, in, um, in, in Tokyo. And what do they pick? What does the blue note side to pick, pick as the picture that goes on the cover to advertise it? That same picture. The one that I didn't see ever. Everybody else sees as being like, Oh, that's gold. 
Do you see now what you didn't see then? I do. I do now. I see it now. I and did what is not it? see it before. I was caught up in like, oh, it's not a sharp picture. It has a little bit of blur to it. Everybody else sees it and like this is packed with emotion and feeling and energy. And it speaks to people. Oh, I saw was like, oh, I wish I had been this. I wish I had been that. Nobody else oh, cares. Wow. Oh. Nobody else cares. Yeah. The stuff that we photographers think about, it really is. Like we go to get a, a picture judged by photographers. But for me, it's, it, it speaks to the idea is that we think about what it should have been and not what it is. And sometimes yes. what it is is exactly yes. what it's meant to be. What it should be. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was a huge lesson for me. Huge lesson for me. All these years later, still learning. Yeah. We, we can't beautiful. get in the way. We need somebody else with brand new eyes. You know, we are caught up sometimes in the experience of the shoot. Like, oh, it was a beautiful day. The sun was shining. It was blue sky. We had a great time. We were eating great food. Maybe that also influences how we feel about a picture. The experience of making the picture, creating the picture. Mm -hmm. But brand new eyes just see the pure, unadulterated image. And that's all that matters at the end of the day. Because I know that that quality is something that I'm always looking for when I'm looking at other people's photographs. Oh. I don't care how sharp it is. I don't care about how perfectly composed it is. I'm no. look, just looking for that spark of something that makes me feel something. And yeah. I forget that when I look at my own photographs, because like you, I'm going, well, it's not as sharp as it should have been. Yes. And I Someone sent me a video from the 90s when Roy DeCarava was in, was in town. And I was a, a board member at what was called the Black Gallery, which is also part of the Black Photographers of California. Oh. And I always remembered this day because kind of Ray de Carava came to our small gallery. We presented him with a book that many of the photographers had worked on. And he held court there for what seemed like an hour. And I always remember that day. And I always talk to people about that moment of just everyone being surrounded and him just talking about work. And someone had recorded a video of it. And I got a copy of it yesterday. And... Besides getting over the shock of how I looked in the 90s, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's one part where he's talking about about shooting, and he was talking about, I, I think, some of the images from the Sweet uh, Fly Paper of Life, the book that he did with, um, I think it's uh, Langston Hughes, and he talks about the images being dark, and he says, the pictures are dark because where I shot them was dark. Oh, right? wow. And he and he said that it wasn't. People think that it's so, so so dark that they can't make a picture. And he says, "There's always a picture there. You may not see it, but the camera and the film will see it. And you make the picture. And it's not about how sharp it is. It's and even how blurry it may be as a as a result of the subjects moving. All that matters is the exposure." Do you have a good exposure so you can make a print? And I don't, I didn't remember that part of the conversation, but I heard it again yesterday and it just blew my mind because one, it sort of explained why so many of his pictures are the way they are. But he was dedicated to making the photograph and not imposing a bunch of rules and expectations. When he made the picture, he was like, there is a picture here and I just need to frame it and press the button. It wasn't about, oh, it needs to be this and it needs to be that, or I can't make it because I don't have this. No, it was just like, there's a moment here and let me take a picture. And I needed to hear that. Wow. I needed to hear that. So I did I. I did that. Oh my God. So did I. Yes. I need to hear that as well, because very often it's about the energy in the picture that makes the picture. And, and also, like, you know, here we are again, getting in the way of ourselves by thinking about, oh, it's not enough light. It's not enough light. Or 
even last night I was out taking pictures thinking that way. And to hear you say that, I'm like, wow, let me just sometimes let that go and just capture the moment. Yeah. Yeah, because you, you really have to sort of let go and accept what accept what the universe and what what the universe is giving you at that moment. Yes, you're making indeed. a judgment call and saying, Oh, I'm not going to or whatever it is, all that you know, all that busyness in the head. And all you have to do, stupid, is raise the camera and press the button. Yeah. Get out the That's way. That's all you have to do. And the fact that, that, you know, at the time he was working, late fifties, early sixties when he made those particular photographs, he wasn't working with much in terms of ISO. Right? So two hundred was probably astronomical back in those days. But he kept making very pictures. True. So it's like I got very little excuse today. That's so true. In terms of complaining, oh, I don't have enough light. That's so true. If these cameras that can go up to like 10,000, 20,000 ISO, we have no <laughs> excuses at all. At all. You're right. Get out the way and just create. Because back then they had film. They were stuck with that ISO 100, 400, whatever. They couldn't change it. Yeah. And they were making incredible images. Yeah. We've got to get out the way. So as you know, as your as your editors were looking through these pictures and they started surprising you with the pictures that they were choosing, how has that how has that uh, influenced the way you're taking a look, not just only work at your past, but the work you're making now? Of uh, majorly, majorly, I'm trying to focus more on capturing an emotion or get back to capturing an emotion versus thinking technical because I do do that. And I, I know I do that. I'm thinking about the lighting a lot. Mm. I'm thinking about sharpness a lot. And that reminded me to not just co get caught in just that. E even, even yesterday as I was shooting, um, cause I'm documenting everything I can about, um, my exhibit because, you know, it'll be over soon. I want to document everything about it. And I let go of like trying to control everything. I just want to document stuff. So that's what I'm going to do the next the next few days of this exhibit. I'll be documenting everything I can about the exhibit. And how many how many prints are up for the exhibit? There are only eighteen prints throughout the the, the Blue Note place right now. So there's a upstairs and downstairs. Um, they have performances at night uh, downstairs. My event. Uh, the opening for the exhibit is like uh, people can come in and see the images for lunchtime. And then at night, they're, they're a packed house at night. So people will see see the images. So there are some on the floor. So people who are sitting downstairs hearing people sing, they can see the images down there. There's one by the DJ booth. There's one in the women's bathroom, one in the men's bathroom. And then upstairs, there's a whole collection. There's, uh, there's 12 upstairs as an actual exhibit. I'm so glad that the Charcoal Book Club has been on this journey with me. I appreciate the support, especially from someone whose mission I really believe in. They are more than a source for buying books. They curate and collaborate with photographers whose books they make available to you and me. They help photographers with the challenging job of getting their books into the hands of people who appreciate it. The fact that there are so many titles that sell out is proof that they're doing something right, both by the photographers and their members. With your membership, you'll receive a quality monograph each month. The books reflect the diversity of genres, photographers, and styles that you'll enjoy even if they are not in the genre of photography you practice yourself. And if you don't like that month's release, you can choose an alternative book of equal value in their catalog. They offer free shipping, to the U.S., Canada, and the U.K., it's subsidized elsewhere. Sign up today and make sure to use the promo code THECANDIDFRAME at checkout to enjoy 10% off your first membership payment. Another great way to enjoy a regular dose of inspiration is a subscription to Frames Magazine, a publication dedicated to showcasing great photography. Published quarterly, the magazine is printed on high-quality paper and reminds me of the great photo magazines of the 60s and 70s. Your membership also includes Frames Digital Companion, a monthly PDF publication. 
You'll also enjoy engaging the Frames Magazine Residence Series, which features a new photographer each month who will share their process and advice via video, audio, and written content. Enjoy what they have to offer by subscribing today and use the promo code THECANDIDFRAME to enjoy a 10% discount on your monthly and yearly subscription when you visit readframes.com forward slash join. And please remember that we are always in need of your financial support. Though the show is free, it takes a lot of time and effort to produce each episode, and your contributions help us to make it all happen. You can contribute $5, $10, $20 or more a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash thecandidframe. But we'd love for you to be a longtime supporter. Your commitment for just three to six months would be helpful. Please consider doing it today. Thank you so much for your continued support. So you talked earlier about, you know, the challenge of choosing images for a book. Yes. There's another challenge when you're choosing just 18 images for an exhibit Ex- of a legend. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> so did you, did you, you talked earlier about getting help. Did you get help for, for in making these choices or? I did a little how bit. How did you come to decide? I, I, I probably should have gotten more help. Um, I let my wife give me her opinion on images, so I chose of those that she liked. And thinking back now, I probably should have given her more control to let her pick all the pictures and put myself out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> that would be much better to do. <laughs> so maybe in the future, I'll, I'll do that for sure. Because I, I do see, even as the exhibit is up, how people are reacting. There's a picture in the show that I was not going to put in that she said, no, you put that in that picture, put that in the show. And mm-hmm. it's the picture people are talking about or keep asking about. So once again, I've got to get out the way and, and you know, let people who talk from, from the heart, let, let that speak louder and let those images be seen. When I, when I teach my workshops, I, I usually immediately take students into a place of discomfort. I want to. I don't want them to give me pictures that they would have given me before taking the workshop, because I want to. I want it to be an opportunity for discovery. And usually, each of them produces an image that's unlike anything that they would have produced before. And there's that quality there that exists. Yes. And one of the things that I often tell them is like, look at you, without you being in complete control but still leveraging all the skills and experience that you have brought to the table to date, you were able to make an image that evokes something in everyone else in the room or in, or in the, in the zoom class, because when those images come up, you hear the reaction. It's not, Oh, that's nice and sharp. You, you hear, Oh, ah, you hear that vocal exclamation when people see the picture. And I tell them this, this image, is has to be an anchor image for you because it demonstrates what you're capable of doing. Wow. Here you had no you had no there was no real purposefulness behind it in terms of making it. You kind of just allowed it to to happen because I limited you in what you were able to do. Like sometimes they're they're not allowed to raise the camera to their eye or use the screen. They just have to approximate the composition and make the picture. Or sometimes they'll be limited only to twelve frames or something. Or whatever whatever the limitation is. And usually the the picture that comes out is so good, and it sort of sets the tone for the rest of the for the class. Wow. And that's something I constantly have to try to remind myself because I know that I had I know I have pictures that have that where my hand is not so heavily on it and when I kind of let go those pictures when those pictures happen I try to remember what I tell those students yeah is that innately I know how to make that photograph but I can't be in complete control in order for it to make it happen. And it seems yes. completely antithetical to photography where you have to be in complete control. And it's trying to find ways where I can just surrender to the, to the process and not be so precious about it. Yeah. And, you know, 
you are a wonderful technician. I can only imagine it must be that much harder for you to be able to let go of the let reins go. enough and, and, tr and sort of trust in it. So what, what do you find that kind of works for you? How do you try to trick yourself into getting into that headspace, even, even just momentarily? It's, it's funny. I think a, a lot of it that holds you back is, is maybe ego. Cause you're like, you want to be in control. You want to show a certain image or certain style. And that's us just maybe getting in the way versus mm -hmm. finding pictures that really resonate. I mean, the bottom line, you want people to remember your work, to be moved by your work. And maybe that means getting out of the way a little bit and forgetting about, you know, what we perceive as being our look or our style and let people view the image, make up their own story in their mind of the image and let that be what they stay with. I mean, at the end of the day, I want pictures that resonate with people, that make a connection with people, with the books, with my images, with stories, with, you know, posts, whatever. You want a picture that's going to have to be sticky. You want a picture that's going to stay with people in some way. So, you know, maybe 200 years later, that picture remains. I want to create images like that, that have that power to resonate with people. Pictures and stories. That's what I want to do. So let's get back to Aretha, because you obviously were able to to elicit that that kind of moment in that photograph that you that you mentioned. And you know, Aretha was photographed by a lot of people, as she was very a aware lot of people of her, of her image. So, yes, and especially now in the age of you know Instagram, people are, are hyper conscious of sort of how they how they look so there are a lot Absolutely. of control issues that are happening on both sides of the lens <laughs> so for you especially now i know you, you you got a set of tools and you know you have your charm that you use and stuff like that but you're in pursuit of that something special so what do you find works for you today this is, this is a question what do you find that works Better for you today to be able to do that than say twenty or thirty years ago. Oh, that's an easy one. the The tools are much better for us. We have advantages today that we did not have five years ago. Uh, not even mentioned twenty years ago. I wish I could go back twenty years ago and take the tools that we have today to capture moments. You know, when I'm shooting film back in you know the early nineties, I am aware about how much film I'm shooting. Today, I don't think about that so much. Also, I was so concerned about, oh, um, will this lens be sharp? All, all those different things. Today, almost every lens is sharp. You know, you, there are super sharp lenses that come uh, to another level, especially with mirrorless today, because that lens is so close to the, you know, to the to the to the back. I mean, you you have the ability to get sharper images, and with with the autofocus that we have today. You know, you don't have to worry about that if you worried before, which I did about I, I loved I've always loved shooting wide open, but I was fearful about doing it before because I'm like, oh, can I get this sharp if I shoot like, you know, 1.2? Can I get this sharp? You know, if they move a little bit now, cameras are at the place where you can and get every image sharp. So I don't have to worry about, you know, you know, I can't. I used to concentrate so much on focus and now you don't have to. It opens you up to being more creative. I, I wish I had the cameras I had today when Aretha was alive. Oh, mm. I would have shot a lot more and been more free to express and get moments, you know, where before I was like, Oh, if I do this, I'm going to lose that moment. I'm going to I'll, I'll miss that moment. And, now you're you're free to create and it just opens up another door i mean another door i had some headshots to do where i work recently and i had a relatively new camera and i thought well let me try this eye detect autofocus and put it in continuous focus 
and continuous drive mode. Because usually I was always just looking for the moment and then pressing the shutter release button. Yes. But I go, I can play here. You know, it doesn't have to be high art here. I just need to come up with a decent photograph. But what I was most interested in is what the experience would be like photographing and doing like a short burst when I, because what I was doing, even though I was doing headshots, I was like talking to the people. Yes. Because then these are all people who are not comfortable being in front of a camera. So it was kind of like engaging them with, you know, light banter. Conversation. And just looking for an unguarded moment. And then I go, Pff. and I wasn't looking through the viewfinder. I basically had them in position and I had the the camera on and I had the, uh, the the live view on. So I could see that they were framed. So I was like right next to the camera and I had like a sh uh, remote release. So my fa so I wouldn't shake the camera when I get too excited, right? Yes. Because I learned yes. that lesson. So I just had the cable release. It was kind of like using an old medium format camera, right? When you were just like press the, the cable release to shoot. Yes. And it was really interesting yes. to see the results because they, they almost all of them were completely sharp. And Isn't my aversion to it had been, oh, what if the eye's not tack sharp? And, oh, I don't want to overshoot. But what I found myself doing is that I would shoot in rapid succession, but it wasn't like 24 frames. It would just be just a couple of a couple of a shots. I was here. still looking for the moment, but I was kind of open to what was going to happen before, during, and after. And not oh. being... And I felt like, well, that, that's, that's still good. It's... Because when I'm shooting the way oh, the way that I used to, it would have to be that exact moment, otherwise it was nothing. And now it's kind of like, well, let's see what plays out. And th I've only done it once, so I need to do it more to see how comfortable I feel with it. But that sounds kind of what you're you're kind of talking about, allowing the technology to create a a, a different way of approaching absolutely, the yeah. Things have changed quite a bit, and we have to adapt to the change. Why shoot the way we've shot 20 years ago when everything has changed so much? I don't even worry about overshooting so much anymore. I want to get moments and find that special moment. And I love that. Do you feel like that the, 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 the way they're using the technology is giving you that? Or is it, is it just increasing the likelihood that you will? Uh, a little bit of both. Because I can be free to look for moments versus thinking about the tech. Because you spend a lot of time in the past thinking about the tech as you're shooting versus like thinking about the, getting these special moments. And I'm sure maybe we all probably missed special moments because we were thinking about that. Today, I can just capture the moments and be concentrating on just that versus ever thinking about the tech. It just opens another door for us creatively. Are you still using strobe or are you using constant light sources? Both. I use strobes and constant light, which I've never always done that my entire career. I've used a lot of constant lights and strobes, and I still do. Uh, in the very beginning, my, my first covers were shot with constant lights. This is like early 90s. I'm using HMI lights back in the 90s, you know, early 90s. Oh, okay. um, now, I still use a lot of constant lights. Uh, I use now a CLX-10. I have uh, an RE Sky panel. I get my pro photo strobes. You know, I use a lot of different tools all the time. Still do. But now it's open doors for me shooting lights in different ways where I couldn't shoot before. Because the technology has improved so much, not just with the cameras and with the lenses, but with lighting, are you just finding new ways of being able to do what you've always done? Or are you find yourself sort of playing and experimenting to see what else you can do with this stuff that's that's new and different? It's funny you ask that question. I am finding myself experimenting a lot more these days because, I mean, you do get bored after a while doing the same thing over and over again. And you want to do it in different ways. And there are different types of lights out there. Like there's like NAN lights out there now that I really enjoy working with a lot where I wouldn't have used those 20 years ago. And now I'm finding myself using even those NAN light uh, wands. And I think it's just to open up this other door to what can be done. I have a friend who's a car photographer. His name is Derek Makishima, and he uses NAN lights to photograph, you know, Ferraris and Lamborghinis and Rolls Royces and does an amazing job with these lights. 
And I'm like, oh, wow. You know, now I live in Japan, so people are very creative in different ways. I'm seeing how, what they're doing, and I'm experimenting as well, as you should. Yeah. Always got to be playing. Always. Always. That's the joy of photography. I work at the Huntington Library in San Marino. It's one of the photographers. And we had to photograph uh, some glo- 18th century globes that over the decades and centuries have been varnished over and over and over again. So they're highly reflective. And so I had to shoot them using polarized strobes with a polarizer on the on the lens and take multiple shots with certain lights turned off and then turned on and then they all had to be composited in order to make one seamless image where you didn't see any of the reflections. Wow. And it was a pain, but it was beautiful at the same time because I'd never done that before. And I love the experience of learning something new. It was about applying the skills that I'd had up to that moment and then taking wow. this technique I'd never done before and creating something and going, that was fun. It was fulfilling. And I think that's that's the only thing that keeps this thing fresh is by constantly putting yourself in a situation where it's unfamiliar, where you just yes. can't do stuff the way you did it before. And if you're working on a regular basis like you are, um, you have to make those opportunities for yourself because everyone's expecting you to do what they know you to do. Right. No, you can't just do that. You've got to push yourself all the time and explore new boundaries and new ways of, you know, why do the same thing all the time? I want to grow as an artist the way every artist does and and evolve. Yes, use my style, but also push it more and more and more because that makes it exciting, makes you stay in love of your craft and makes you keep creating new work that people want to see and are curious to see. So that's that's my goal. I wish I could do more with the Aretha. I wish I had done, uh, you know, that I did back then. I wish I could have done more with her. In, with respect to what? Just having had more time to make pictures of her or made particular kinds of photographs of her? Particular kinds of images. I would wish I had pushed her more. Um, well, we always say that going back in time. I wish you could have done this, wish you could have done that. But yeah, I wish I had had uh, time to do other types of things. I wish I had been able to shoot that last image of her before she passed um, that we were trying so hard to shoot. Um, that's part of the reason why I'm doing this book, you know, Aretha Cool, to share what I do have and talk about those moments as well. I think people, I think photographers will learn from seeing the book, from hearing the stories, um, and want to hear more and see more, hopefully, you know, Aretha Cool. What do you think? she gave you as a subject that you remember most? I know what that is already, right off the top of my head. She gave me her honest, unadulterated self. She was herself around me, where so many people are guarded and want to give a certain image. And and I think in the past, she did. She definitely did at one point in her career. And toward the end, I don't think she was as guarded as she was earlier in her career, where she was trying to uh, control the press on her before and all those things at, at our photo shoots she was being herself mm. all the time and you only do that with people that you trust she trusted me and how do you think that gift she gave you made you a better photographer <laughs> I think it made me able to also open up and be vulnerable to her as well. And in showing my vulnerable side to her, she opened up. I think that she gave me that lesson. So I can continue doing that as I shoot people now to not only want to capture people, but be open to showing the essence of me, which helps them open up more. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore, and it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that photographer be and why? I'm going to refer Kwaku Alston. Um, 
photographer in LA, good friend of mine who love his work. I've watched, we both come up around the same time. He's a little younger than me actually, but watched him grow as a photographer, evolve as a photographer, another uh, photographer of color who has navigated this industry that's not easy to navigate and has done well and as is evolving even now as we speak. He does talk about retiring, has, has always talked about that, but I don't think he ever will. I don't think any of us ever will. We just, we love what we do. Great photographer. He did a shoot of an icon. He's done many icons, but there's a shoot that I was supposed to do in South Africa. I had to turn it down. I referred them to him. He ended up doing the job. Um, he had 10 minutes to shoot this person. This is Mandela. I had to turn the job down because I was, I got, I had a job shooting Michael Jordan which I could not back out of at the last minute. And this assignment came up at the last minute. They wanted me to leave that night, fly to South Africa and photograph Mandela. I could not do it because of my shoot with Michael Jordan. So I referred Kwaku Alston, who ended up doing the job, and did an amazing job, but he had 10 minutes only with Mandela, but he pulled off an amazing <laughs> image. Oh, I'm going to have to take a look at what that image was. Yes, yes, fly out, fantastic. All the way out to South Africa on the last minute. You know, from LA, and you have and you have and ten, ten minutes. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that's but that's our that's our that's our industry, you know. And you know, you can make a great image in ten minutes if you know what you're doing. Oh, you certainly do. Thank you, brother. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to Matthew for joining us. Find out more about Matthew and his work by visiting MatthewJordansmith.com. And if you're a fan of our work, you can write reviews on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts and share a favorite episode on social networks, be it Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Remember to use the hashtag TheCandidFrame. You can support us financially by contributing via PayPal or Patreon. Thanks to Tracy Adams and Andrew Glickman for their recent contributions. It means so much. We have also relaunched our newsletter, and if you want to receive updates on everything related to The Candid Frame, as well as book recommendations and announcements for special events on workshops, not only from us, but some of our guests, please sign up by visiting our website. And if you can't find every show episode on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts, download The Candid Frame app, available for Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who I can't thank enough. And you can find him at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And this is Ibadian X, and this is The Candid Frame.